Well, good morning, church family. It's wonderful to be here with you again on this uh, Sunday morning. Julie and I were here in our church building, and uh, it's empty, just a few chairs, and uh, my wife and I, my guitar, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so it's good to be here today, and we want to welcome you. We want to welcome all of our visitors that are tuning in as well. We pray that today you'll be blessed by worship as we just enter into the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. And I just want to also encourage you this morning that you might be feeling discouraged, but listen, David went through that as well. And you know, in Psalm 27, verse 13, he, uh, he, he wrote something that is so powerful. We need to hold on to it today. And David said, in, in all of his opposition and all of his discouragement, he said, I would have given up, but I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Hallelujah. We can hold on to that promise today. Because just like David, we're going we're gonna to see God's goodness. We're going to see his promises fulfilled. We're going to see his blessings upon our life like never before. Don't give up. Come on. Don't give up now because God's just getting ready to do something powerful and wonderful in your life. And that's what this song is all about. Hallelujah. It is the goodness of the Lord. Amen. Yes, 
Anyway, having said all that, I want to say this. Uh, you know what? We're living in a time. We are living in a, uh, a, a time when God is doing something new. And as a church, we have to be very sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is saying, to what the Holy Spirit is doing. Jesus said, let them that have an ear hear what the Spirit is saying unto his church. And that is you and me this morning. Hallelujah. And so we have to understand that we're living in a paradigm shift. A paradigm shift is that, that uh, transition time from the old to the new. When God is doing something new, there's going to be something new, something fresh, something, uh, something more powerful that God has wanted to do in the body of Christ. It is a paradigm shift in which we are engaged in. And paradigm shifts are not comfortable, not at all. They're very difficult. They're very uncomfortable. Uh, they come with a lot of pressure. They come with a lot of questions. They come with a lot of perplexity and not knowing. All of those things come in a paradigm shift when God is doing something new, taking us from the old to the new. The old had its time. The old had its place. But Jesus said that there was going to be a time for new wineskins in order to hold the new wine. And I believe that we're in that very generation time period right now that God is about to break forth on the scene with something new. And listen to me, friends, because our old traditions and our old way of doing things and our old religious attitudes and mindsets that were fine for a season and a time are no longer perhaps valid today, perhaps are no longer effective today, and our old traditions be can become an idol. They can become an idol. You know, we want to stand for truth. We want to stand for what's right. We want to stand for the old ways. We, we've always done it this way. And God says, yes, it was fine for that time. Just like Peter on the rooftop, he's up there praying. It was a paradigm shift for the church. It was, a, it was a time when God was doing something new in the body of Christ. The old ways were past. The old ways had their fulfillment. The old ways had their time. And now God was doing something new. Peter's up on the roof praying. And God brings down, he has a vision of a sheet filled with all these different unclean animals. And God says, Peter, take and eat. And Peter says, no, Lord, he couldn't understand what God was doing. He couldn't get past this, this new thing that was taking place because he was in a paradigm shift along with all the other apostles and believers. And Peter said, no, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. And God says to Peter, Peter, don't, don't call unclean what I'm calling clean. In other words, God was saying, Peter, this salvation... This new gospel is not only for the Jews, it's for the Gentiles. And I'm sending you to the Gentiles. This is a whole new way of doing things. It was a new concept for the church. And, and, and God had to break down their idolatry. And, and it wasn't something that they willfully were doing. It, it's, it's because it was something new and they couldn't get their mind wrapped around it. They couldn't understand that this was of the Holy Spirit. And they wanted to still involve the, the old ways of Judaism along with this new gospel. And it just didn't work. It wouldn't mix. And, and, and the, you know, Peter and the apostles, they had to come to that conclusion that it's got to be God's way and not man's way, not the old traditional ways any longer. And friends, we've got to be so careful, you know, because our convictions, as good as they are and as righteous as they are, and because my convictions have changed over the years, I've been saved for over 40 years now, and the convictions that I once held tight to years ago <clears throat> have, have, have evolved into more of God's heart now, God's mind now, God's purposes and plans, the new thing that he's doing today. And it's not a comfortable thing to go through. It's very painful because sometimes your convictions can become so ingrained within you. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but there comes a time when God says, I'm doing something new. Your old convictions are, have now become an idol. It's an idol. God's not in it. God is saying, I'm, I'm evolving you, I'm, trans, I'm transforming you, I'm changing you, I'm taking you out of the old into something new, and you've got to be free, and the Holy Spirit has to be free to do what He wants to do. We've got to allow the Holy Ghost to come in with new measures and new methods and new, you know, just, just new uh, things that He wants to do, things that we have to allow Him to do and embrace and receive you know, with, a, with a, an attitude of God, do it your way, Lord. 
Not our will, God. What worked before might not work today, friends. That's the whole challenge that the church is facing today. And we've got to let go of the old. We've got to release it. It's done with. God used it for a purpose. And that comes, you know, to worship music. That comes to uh, uh, um, the way that we dress. It comes to so many things, you know, that we have so become ingrained to that this is the way it has to be. This is what's honoring to God. And, and you know what? God is saying, listen, I'm doing something new and you better get on my program. And woe to the church that refuses to get onto God's program in this new paradigm shift, this new generation which we are facing today. Because it's that serious, friends. We don't know how much time we have, but we do know this. Our world is not the same as it was three or four months ago. The church is not the same as it was three or four months ago. God is getting ready to break out into new things, hallelujah, new dimensions, New prophetic worship, hallelujah. New prophetic messages from the Spirit of God, not canned messages where we open up our file drawer and we find an old message. Well, yeah, this I preached this a couple of years ago and it, it was really good and I think I'll use that one again today. No, 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 no. It's time now to get prophetic with the Lord. It's time to get the mind of God for this very generation in which we are living. And it does not come easy and it does not come comfortable because it's it's like being it's like being stripped out of things that you become so familiar with, so at ease with, so you know, things that are just so uh, you know prof- ingrained within your spirit. And God is saying, I'm doing something new now. And so we've got to allow the Holy Spirit to do that. And I want to ask you something right now. What kind of a legacy are you gonna leave behind? And this is, you know, I don't intend for this to be some kind of a funeral message, but but it's a reality check. Come on, church. This is a reality check. Let me ask you that question again. What kind of a legacy? What are you going to be leaving behind when you're no longer on this earth, when you've left your family and friends and you've gone home to glory to be with the Lord? Because one day, you and I, if Jesus continues to tarry, we're, we're going to go the same way. We will go through the way of the grave. Our bodies will die, and we will go home to be with the Lord, and our work here on earth, our influence, everything that we've done on this earth will be no more. And so what are we going to leave behind for our children? What are we going to leave behind for our grandchildren? What are we going to leave behind for our church family? What are we going to leave behind to the people that are close to us, the people that know us? What kind of an impact, what kind of an influence will continue on? even after we're gone. That's what it means, you know, to, to leave behind, uh, you know, a legacy. And a legacy a legacy is something that you leave behind. It's, it's something that people will remember you by. It's something that people will be inspired by when they hear your name or when they remember something, you know, they had a memory of you. And, and you know, what kind, of a, what kind of an inspiration is that gonna leave behind? It's a very important question for you and I to consider because we have no idea you know, when our last breath is going to come. And so we, we have to be very mindful of that, that God, I want to be right in your will, Lord. I want to be right exactly doing what you want me to be doing, God. And I don't care how much it hurts, and I don't care how much it, it costs. I don't care the price that you have to pay. I may lose some friends. I may lose some church members. But God, I've got to do it your way because there's much more at stake than what I'm aware of right now. Because God is looking at souls, friends. He's not looking at how well I dress. He's not looking at how well I sing. He's not looking at how well I preach. None of that means a thing. What God wants is my heart. What God wants is my attention. What God wants is my will. To simply say, not my will, Father, but your will be done, God. And Lord, whatever new wineskins you want to develop in this church, so be it, God. So be it, Lord. Because in the end, it's going to count for eternity. I don't care about my name's sake. I don't care about my reputation. I care about God's reputation. I care about what God wants to do in me and through me. Hallelujah. And yes, I'm getting older on in years, but that doesn't matter. Yes, I have comfort zones. You know, things that I, I've always you know felt uh, comfortable with. Things that were familiar with me. It doesn't matter anymore. Those things don't matter anymore. And I'm not just saying, you know, let's just do whatever we want to do. That's not what we're talking about here this morning. I'm talking about leaving behind a legacy when that time comes. I'm talking about leaving behind, you know, a a life 
that is going to continue to minister and speak to people and bless people and comfort people and encourage people long after I'm gone. Hallelujah. That's what we're talking about here this morning. I remember, you know, years, years back, I was in a service at Koinonia Church here in uh, Kitchener-Waterloo area. And I remember Pastor Steve Fleming, and he said something so profound that I've never forgotten it. And he said, I want to leave behind a church that my children would be happy to take over. I thought, wow, that's amazing. You know what that means? It means we've got to be willing to give up some of our preferences. It means we've got to be willing to give up some of our favorite songs and, you know, those kind of, you know, message uh, preaching methods and styles. You know, away with all of that, church, come on. Away with all of that. We've got to let the Holy Spirit do what He wants to do. And I'm not talking about a free-for-all. I'm not talking about where the church becomes a circus and a pandemonium of confusion. God forbid, that's not how it works. The Apostle Paul made that very clear in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He said, let everything, talking about a church service, he said, let everything be done decently and in order. And now let me share this with you right now, that when the Holy Spirit is having his way in a church service, when he has full reign and control in a church service, you can be sure that everything that happens will be done decently and in order. And that means that whatever God wants to do spontaneously in a service, whatever God wants to do, you know, uh, you, you know, just in one accord, when we are all in one accord, the Holy Spirit will come down, glory to God, like he did in the book of Acts in chapter 2, when they were all in one accord in the upper room and the fire fell, hallelujah. It's time that we allow the fire to fall. We pray for revival. We preach about revival. You know, we say, oh, we need revival. We want revival. Well, listen to me. How do you think it's going to come until we're in one accord allowing the Holy Ghost to be free to do what He wants to do? Because the Bible says that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Glory to God. And we've got to strive for that freedom. We have to desire that freedom. We don't want to be in bondage to idols. We don't want to be in bondage to old wineskins that no longer can hold the new wine. Old traditions that are causing churches to dry up and become dead and formal and closing the doors. God forbid. This is not the time for the church to be on retreat. This is not the time for the church to be defeated. This is not the time for the church to close its doors. This is the time for the church to expand its borders, to increase its territory, to take the ground, glory to God, that the enemy has stolen. It's time for the church to reclaim stolen ground, to reclaim lives and souls and people that are being captured by the devil at their own will. It is time, church, if the world needs to see the reality of a church on fire that is, that is living what it preaches in love and in mercy and in good works and reaching out and helping those that are at their wits end, helping those, ministering to those who need help, who need shelter, who need food, who need basic things of life. And that's where you and I come in with the reality of, of love and mercy and with that desire that after we are gone from this world, however, whenever, however that happens, that our life will continue to minister through those who have been left behind, through those who are still, you know, still uh, ministering, still, you know, part of the church family that are still out there, you know, ministering the word of God, speaking words of encouragement and healing and conviction, words of warning, get ready because Jesus Christ is coming. All of, the, all of the truth of God's gospel that we've got to be, you know, willing and ready to, to, to just to declare it with boldness, with authority, but in meekness and love. Because there's no other name under heaven we know that it's the name of Jesus Christ. People need to get saved, and that's the only way they're going to get saved. They have to have a hope. They have to have, a, they have, to have a, a, you know, a, somebody to show them that this is not the end. That things are not going to just continue to get worse and worse and worse, and there's no hope. Because why would we bother even coming to church? Why would we bother even going out there and ministering in the power of the Holy Spirit and trying to help you know, people in their state of need if there's no more hope? How futile, how foolish that would be, how in vain that would be if we thought that's just as far as it goes and there's nothing more. No, 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 no. I want to live my life in the light of eternity. I want to live my life here on this earth however much time I have left. I want 
every single second to count. I want my life, come on, to make a difference, church. Is that what you want? I pray that all the time, God, let my life make a difference in this world. Hallelujah. Because when I'm gone, if I should still, if, if Jesus has not yet come and I take my last breath, I want to be sure that my life is going to continue to be a blessing to the people that are still here in this world. I want my life to leave a legacy. And it means leaving your mark. That's what it means, leaving your mark. That God created you to fulfill a certain plan and purpose of your destiny. And you can leave this world knowing that you did that totally, completely, faithfully. You have fulfilled it. And now that work is going to continue on through those who are still here. Hallelujah. Whether it's through your own children or grandchildren. Whether it's through your friends or associates, ministry, whatever it is. That we can still continue on. And that's exactly what... Uh, Paul writes to Timothy, young Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, he says this, Timothy, listen to this, the things that you have heard from me, right, the scriptures, the teaching, you know, the truth that, that, that Paul instructed Timothy with from God's word, he says, the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's what it's all about. That I can teach those that are faithful, and then they in turn can, can teach others that are faithful, and it just continues to progress on and on and on. So that there's a generation, and a generation, and a generation of those who are, who are continuing on with the legacy that has been left behind for them, hallelujah. You know, my parents did not leave a legacy for me, not at all. And I've shared this from time to time. That uh, my parents, I don't think they really knew how. I don't think they really knew how to raise a family. They they sent us kids to church, but they didn't go. <laughs> I think they just wanted a couple of hours, you know, without us around the house. And so they would send us to church, and I thank God for that because the things I've learned did not come from my mom and dad. They came from my Sunday school teachers. That's right. And that's that's amazing. But I'll tell you one thing, my grandparents, they are the ones that left the legacy for the Noel family. Whether we appreciate that or not, whether we understand that or not. And we didn't really get to know our grandparents all that well because they lived in New York and, you know, there just wasn't a whole lot of uh, communication. There wasn't a lot of visitation uh, at that time. I remember only one time as a young boy. I might have been eight, nine, or ten years old. I remember only one time ever seen my grandfather. And he was a short man, he was a very serious looking man, very kind man, very man of authority. And uh, he, was a, he was a preacher along with his wife. They were both powerful preachers and powerful prayer, uh, prayer warriors, that's what they were. He was uh, an ordained minister with the Assemblies of God and uh, he was a powerful man of God. And I only saw him that one time, but you know, even now looking back and remembering you know, his form standing before me there in our home as just a young boy and remembering, you know, wow, there was something about this man that has, has just continued to minister to me. Uh, you know, he left behind a legacy for us kids and, and they prayed for us kids and they prayed us. And I thank God that, that they prayed us into salvation. They prayed us into a relationship with God. Hallelujah. Some have chosen not to walk that path. Others in my family have chosen to serve him. But they left us a legacy, hallelujah. A legacy that my own mom and dad did not leave, perhaps could not leave because they didn't know how. And I've said this before, I don't blame them one bit. I love my parents with all of my heart. I always did, and I still do to this day. But you know, the, the importance of leaving that legacy behind it is so important. That's what Paul said to Timothy. Timothy, remember the things I'm teaching you, and then you teach the same things to faithful men. That's how it works. That's how it works. And so, you know, as God begins this new move of the Holy Ghost that he's doing, because we're living in the time where Joel chapter 2 and Acts chapter 2, they say the same thing, that the time is going to come in the last days, that God is going to pour out his spirit, amen, upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, old men shall dream dreams, young men shall have visions. Come on, church, that is what God is doing here today, and he is now preparing his body, his church, his people, 
people with new wineskins to be able to hold the outpouring of the Holy Ghost so that we don't reject it, we don't refuse it, we don't, we don't uh, uh, resist it. None of that. We receive it with open arms. Our wineskins are wide open. Come on, Holy Spirit, fill us and fill us and fill us again. Fill us to overflowing because we want the real wine. We want the real power of the Holy Ghost in our services like we've never known. We don't want to try to manufacture it up. As yeah, some churches do, they try to they try to you know build it up. They try to manufacture the power of the Holy Spirit in the flesh. But no, it's the Spirit of God that's going to be poured out. He's doing that today, and He's getting His church ready for that very thing. And as I said at the beginning of this message, it's not a comfortable thing because it's changing everything that we've come to know. It's changing everything that we've become comfortable with and familiar with. And we're going out into uncharted territory, and it is exciting, and it is a time for us to keep our eyes on Christ. As my son, Pastor Matt, preached last Sunday, we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus in the middle of this storm, because we're going over to the other side in this time of paradigm shift, when God is doing something totally, radically, powerfully, fanatically real. Hallelujah. And I'm excited about it. I'm excited about it because I want to be in the very front lines. I want to be in the very center of this new thing that God is breaking forth on every side. Hallelujah. All around the world, wherever God has a church, wherever God has somebody praying and crying out to him, wherever God, wherever there's somebody who's just seeking the Lord with all of their hearts, that is where there's this shift is going to take place. This new work of the Holy Ghost is going to take place. Hallelujah. And everything that has been done before had its purpose and its time in order to prepare the body of Christ for today. Hallelujah. That's what it means, friends, to leave a legacy. My grandparents are no longer alive today, but they left a legacy of, of prayer and of the Word of God and of faithfulness to God. And, and of the power of the Holy Spirit, they left that legacy, that Pentecostal power, into this man standing here today. Hallelujah. So their work continues on through me and through all the others that they touched in their life, all the others that they left an influence and an inspiration for Christ in their life. That's as powerful as it gets to think that you can leave behind that kind of a legacy. Hallelujah. Now, Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, he said this. He said, a man's life, listen to me now, does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possesses. I'm going to say that again. Jesus said, a man's life, a woman's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he or she possesses. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus uh, shares a parable of a rich man who was a businessman. He had all kinds of wealth. He had all these fields that were producing in abundance, whatever the harvest happened to be. And he had a problem, and he said, I've got this problem. He said, I got, I got this amazing crop, and I have nowhere to put it. And then he said, I know what I'll do. I'm going to build myself bigger barns, and I'll put all of my crops and all of my harvest into these barns, and I'll have it made for the rest of my life. And I'll sit back and I'll just say, soul, take it easy. You've done a good job. You've earned your way. You've made it to the top. You've become a success. You've got it all that you could ever have. Every dream that you've had has all come true. I've got it made, and now I can just, you know, take it easy for the rest of my life and enjoy my wealth. Enjoy my wealth and all of my riches and all of my pleasures and all of my comforts. And that very night, Jesus said that God came to him and said, You fool. You fool. You fool. Don't you know that your soul is required of you this night? And then who's going to get all of that wealth? Instead of that rich man sharing everything that, that God had blessed him with, sharing it with those in need, going out there and, and, and blessing others and, and giving them help where they needed it. Instead of him doing that, he, he just kept it all for himself and he thought that that's what it meant to be a success. You have all the riches of the world and no more worries, concerns, or problems, not knowing that that very night his life was going to be gone. Do you know what, friends? That is a real trap from the enemy today to get us so focused on the things of this world, to get us distracted from what God is calling us to do. 
I just had a conversation earlier with my daughter-in-law, Cindy Noel, and you know, she was saying the very same thing to me. She said that the enemy's game plan today, right now, is to try to get the body of Christ all distracted and in confusion and all caught up in everything else except the will of God and the name of God and His, His holiness and His glory in the church today, the new thing that God desires to do. The devil's plan is to get us all distracted and, and all caught up in all of those things. And guess what, church? It seems to be working. We've got we've to gotta remove ourselves from all of that. We've got to get back connected to God once again in His Word and in prayer. We've got to stay focused. We've got to walk with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We've got to abide in the vine and our lives will count and make a difference then. For all of eternity, hallelujah, here and now. we got to be so wise to what the enemy is doing. We cannot allow, you know, fame or fortune or wealth or, or all of those things to consume us and distract us from our true calling, which is laying down our lives and leaving behind a legacy for those that, that we have made a difference in. Praise the Lord. And you know, I remember some years back, I, I did a funeral for a... A man that I had uh, never even met, but I received a call and asked if I could uh, do it from the family, and I said, yes, I'd be happy to do that. And uh, <clears throat> this was a man who could, the world would have considered to be a great success. Uh, he had much wealth and uh, property and uh, fame, and his, his uh, picture was even on the front cover of Success Magazine. And this is a magazine that is dedicated to promoting success. And uh, they, they, they have people uh, in their magazines and on the cover, people such as Donald Trump and uh, Martha Stewart and uh, uh, Jeff Bezos and many others as well. Uh, people that have come to become a success and uh, become uh, acquainted with fame and fortune in the world's eyes. Many, many big names and his particular face, his, his face was on this magazine as well. And so in the world's eyes, this was a man who made it. He made it to the top. And so when I went into the funeral home, it was time to start the service. And as the uh, directors led us into the sanctuary room, the chapel, I was amazed. I thought to myself, am I in the wrong funeral home? Because I had expected to see, you know, a, a, an entire packed room full of people that were there to pay their respects to this very successful man. And to my surprise, there was only maybe a dozen people there, a dozen people there that had come to say their final goodbyes to this man of the world, this successful man. And you know what made me realize that, you know, it doesn't matter how much wealth we amass, it doesn't matter what our net worth is, it doesn't matter what people may think of us, our popularity, you know, our fame and our fortune, we've arrived, we've made it, you know, we've, we, we've, we've done it. None of that matters whatsoever if we do not leave behind a legacy for Christ. If we do not leave behind a legacy that is going to continue on teaching, ministering, preparing, inspiring, you know, instructing our life, those who are still behind. That's what a legacy is all about. I want to leave a legacy behind for my children and for my children's children. And for everybody who knows me, I want my life to continue to minister well after I'm gone if Jesus has not yet come back. That's my prayer. That's my desire. And, you know, that's what we need to be focusing on in these last days. It has nothing to do with how much property you acquire. It has nothing to do with how much money you make. It has nothing to do with the titles that you hold. It has nothing to do with the awards that you receive, friends. It has to do with leaving behind a legacy. And so I want to ask you four questions here today before closing this message. Number one, what difference will your life have made once you are gone? What difference will your life have made once you are gone? And that's my concept for what I want my life to make a difference in some way, in somehow, with whoever, whoever, Lord, I can. That's my prayer, Lord. Let my life make a real difference for eternity. Question number two, what will people remember about you the most when you are no longer here, right? When they think about you, oh, you know, that person was so kind. They were so generous. 
They were so helpful. They were so honest and transparent. They were so faithful and caring. Is that what people will remember about your life? Yes, with all of our faults and failures, of course. But is that the things that will stick out to them, your legacy, after you're gone? They will think about you in those very wonderful, powerful virtues. You know, your godliness, your holiness, your goodness, you know, your, your, your grace, you know, just the way that you lived your life, you know, so gentle, so, so encouraging, so committed. Those are the things that people need to remember about you because of the legacy that you left behind of a life that you lived on earth. Question number three. When people hear your name or remember you, will they feel inspired? Will they feel inspired? Will they miss you? When they think about you, will tears come to their eyes? When they think about you, will they thank God for your life? That's what it means to leave behind a legacy that is going to you know, continue to work on and on and on in this time frame, this generation that we're living in. And then question number four, who are the people that you will have affected for Christ? Who are the people, whether family, friends, neighbors, associates, work, work, friends, whatever, who are the people that you will have affected in your life for Christ? Some years back, I was walking to my doctor's office and there was a, a pathway through a cemetery that would take me right to the building that I needed to go to. And so it was a very peaceful, beautiful sunny day and I was walking along. <clears throat> and as I was walking through this cemetery, I just happened to be noticing some of the different tombstones and some of the different, uh, you know, uh, uh, epitaphs that were there written on these stones and I happened to come across one and it just caught my eye and it so stirred my heart and it simply said this in five words I have kept the faith I have kept the faith you know what if there was something that I wanted written on my tombstone I think that would probably be it I have kept the faith that's the legacy that I want to leave behind to everybody who knew Mike Noel you know, from my, my earlier years right up till now, right up till however more years I have, I want people to remember me as a man who kept the faith, a man who was faithful to God, a man who loved people, a man who truly cared about people, who had compassion for people, a man who would not compromise on God's word, a man who would come down to the level where others are at, a man who who could just, uh, you know, who could just uh, meet with anybody and, and just, you know, be able to love them and be able to, to just, you know, be real, to be real towards them, who I am. That's, that's who I want people to remember me by. And that's the legacy that I want to be able to leave in this world. I have kept the faith, glory to God. And so I want you to really consider that today as we close this service, just before we go to prayer. I want you to really consider that you may be very young you may be very healthy you've got everything going for you you know everything's just wonderful right now in your life in spite of the virus and all of the you know different uh, things that are changing that way but i want you to just really consider today you might be an older person maybe your health isn't all that good maybe you don't have much time left you need to also consider even now with whatever time you do have what kind of a legacy am I going to leave behind in this paradigm shift in which we are evolving into right now? It's not coming, friends. It's already here. The paradigm shift. We're already in the transition. It's here. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon all flesh all over this world. Hallelujah. Because God is preparing his people. He's preparing his bride so that God's going to take us out of this world when Jesus comes. Hallelujah. But until then, until then, pray and ask God, God, what kind of a legacy am I going to leave behind? Am I going to leave a legacy behind that's going to continue to minister to people after I'm gone? Or will people just forget about me? Will people, won't even remember, me? won't even care, won't even notice? Wouldn't that be a horrible thing to live your life right to the end and nobody even notices that you're gone? 
Nobody even cares. Nobody thinks about you. I don't want to leave that kind of a legacy. And I know by God's grace, I'm not going to leave that kind of a legacy. I'm going to leave a legacy that is going to minister, continue to minister to many hearts after I'm gone. That's the difference that my life is going to make in this world. Hallelujah. And so let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this prophetic time in which we are living, God. There's no greater time for the body of Christ to be alive right now on this planet. Lord, to see the glory of God, to see the fulfillment of your prophetic word, God, coming to pass. God, as you pour out your Holy Ghost upon all flesh, Lord, God, we thank you, Lord, that this is going to be a last call for men and women to get right with God. And Lord, I pray, Father, that our lives will speak, our lives will minister, our lives will reflect, Lord, God, your goodness and your grace and your loving kindness and your mercy, God, your salvation and your deliverance, Father, to a world, God, that is so bent on sin, a world that is so, Lord, and captured by the enemy, a world that is captivated, God, by, by the things of this world. Father, we pray, God, break through, Holy Spirit, break through all of that trapping, and God, open up their blinded eyes, Father, and let them see Christ in us. In us, the hope of glory. Let them see Jesus in our lives, in our words, our attitudes, our deeds. Lord, everything about us, O oh God, I pray. Let them see the reality and the truth of Christ, the joy and the peace that you give, God. Lord, I pray, Lord, that our lives will make a difference right here on this earth, Father, with all the people that you've brought into our life, all the people that we're connected with, Father. First of all, family, and then friends, Lord. And then, God, people that we come to know on a daily basis. God, I pray, Lord, that we will leave behind, God, a life, a legacy, an example. Lord, uh, Lord, such an impact. I pray that we will make a huge impact for Christ. Lord, in our own simple way. God, just our own simple way of reaching out. Lord, to help with love, with mercy, with kindness. And God, I pray, Lord, that we will be free from the trap of this world. God, with all of its wealth and all of its riches and all of its fame, trying to make a name for ourselves, trying to make a position and a title for ourselves. Oh, God, I pray, Lord, humble us now. God, humble us, strip us, God, from all of those vain things, all the vanity of this world, God, so that we can be set apart, Lord, to serve you and you only, Jesus. And so, God, that our life could be a living testimony for others to follow, for others to want to emulate, for others to want to live, God. As Paul the Apostle said, follow me as I follow Christ. Lord, I pray that people will follow us, our example, and our lifestyle, and our attitude, and Christ in us. Hallelujah, the hope of glory. So, Lord, thank you, God, for this hour in which we are living, Lord, this, this predestined time that your word has already told us, God, that would come, and it has now come, praise the Lord. God, that along with the evil, along with the wickedness, there's going to be such an uprising of holiness and godliness, such an uprising of the church and the power and the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. Oh, my, my, my. So, Father, we thank you, God, today for all that you are equipping us and preparing us to do in this final hour, Lord, this paradigm shift in which we're in. Hallelujah. God, oh God, save this world, we pray, through us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said amen and amen. Amen. God bless you. I'm so glad you tuned in today. Again, I want to remind you that next Sunday we're going to be holding services once again with restrictions, of course. We're going to be very, you know, uh, careful as far as the numbers, as far as, uh, you know, the protocol and all the different uh, things that are required of us. So, you know, distancing and everything else. But we're going to have church. And I know that the Spirit of God is going to be in this place. God is going to come down with such power, with such love, with such vision. God is going to increase our vision. He's going to increase our passion. He's going to bring new wineskins into Freedom Life Church, hallelujah, for such a time as this. And so the Lord bless you. If we can help you in any way, just check the phone number right on the screen. You can also contact us on our website. And so the Lord bless you. Thank you again for tuning in. Bye-bye for now.